In England, the Lord of Misrule, known in Scotland as the Abbot of Unreason and in France as the Prince des Sots, was an officer appointed by lot during Christmastide to preside over the Feast of Fools. The Lord of Misrule was generally a peasant or sub-deacon appointed to be in charge of Christmas revelries, which often included drunkenness and wild partying. The church held a similar festival involving a boy bishop. This custom was abolished by Henry VIII in 1541, restored by the Catholic Queen Mary I and again abolished by Protestant Elizabeth I, though here and there it lingered on for some time longer. On the continent it was suppressed by the Council of Baal in 1431, but was revived in some places from time to time, even as late as the 18th century. In the Tudor period, the Lord of Misrule, sometimes called the Abbot of Misrule or the King of Misrule, is mentioned a number of times by contemporary documents referring to rebels both at court and among the ordinary people. While mostly known as a British holiday custom, some folklorists, such as James Fraser and Mikhail Bakhtin, who is said to have plagiarized the novel idea from Fraser, have claimed that the appointment of a Lord of Misrule comes from a similar custom practiced during the Roman celebration of Saturnalia. In ancient Rome, from 17 to 23 December, in the Julian calendar, a man chosen to be a mock king was appointed for the Feast of Saturnalia, in the guise of the Roman deity Saturn. At the end of the festival, the man was sacrificed. This hypothesis has been heavily criticized by William Ward Fowler and as such, the Christmas custom of the Lord of Misrule during the Christian era and the Saturnalian custom of antiquity may have completely separate origins. The two separate customs, however, can be compared and contrasted. History Ancient Rome On 1 January, AD 400, the Bishop Asterius of Amasi in Pontus Amasia, Turkey, preached a sermon against the Feast of Calends. This foolish and harmful delight that describes the role of the mock king in late antiquity. The New Year's feast included children arriving at each doorstep, exchanging their gifts for reward. This festival teaches even the little children, artless and simple, to be greedy, and accustoms them to go from house to house and to offer novel gifts, fruits covered with silver tinsel. For these they receive, in return, gifts double their value, and thus the tender minds of the young begin to be impressed with that which is commercial and sordid. Asterius, in. Oratio 4, Adversus Calendarum Festum. It contrasted with the Christian celebration held, not by chance, on the adjoining day. We celebrate the birth of Christ, since at this time God manifested himself in the flesh. We celebrate the Feast of Lights, Epiphany, since by the forgiveness of our sins we are led forth from the dark prison of our former life into a life of light and uprightness. Asterius. Oratio 4. Significantly, for Asterius the Christian feast was explicitly an entry from darkness into light, and although no conscious solar nature could have been expressed, it is certainly the renewed light at midwinter that was celebrated among Roman pagans, officially from the time of Aurelian, as the festival of the birth of the unconquered sun. Meanwhile, throughout the city of Amasi, although entry into the temples and holy places had been forbidden by the decree of Theodosius I, 391, the festival of gift giving when all is noise and tumult. In a rejoicing over the new year, with a kiss and the gift of a coin, went on all around, to the intense disgust and scorn of the bishop. This is misnamed a feast, being full of annoyance, since going out of doors is burdensome, and staying within doors is not undisturbed. For the common vagrants and the jugglers of the stage, dividing themselves into squads and hordes, hang about every house. The gates of public officials they besiege with a special persistence, actually shouting and clapping their hands until he that is beleaguered within, exhausted, throws out to them whatever money he has and even what is not his own. And these mendicants going from door to door follow one after another, and, until late in the evening, there is no relief from this nuisance. For crowd succeeds crowd, and shout, shout, and loss, loss. Asterius. Oratio 4. Honest farmers coming into the city were likely to be jeered at, spanked and robbed. Worse. Even our most excellent and guileless prophets, the unmistakable representatives of God, who when unhindered in their work are our faithful ministers, are treated with insolence. 
For the soldiers, they spend all their wages in riot and loose women, see plays perhaps. For they learn vulgarity and the practices of actors. Their military discipline is relaxed and slackened. They make sport of the laws and the government of which they have been appointed guardians. For they ridicule and insult the august government. They mount a chariot as though upon a stage, they appoint pretended lictors and publicly act like buffoons. This is the nobler part of their ribaldry. But their other doings, how can one mention them? Does not the champion, the lion-hearted man, the man who when armed is the admiration of his friends and the terror of his foes, loose his tunic to his ankles, twine a girdle about his breast, use a woman's sandal, put a roll of hair on his head in feminine fashion, and ply the distaff full of wool, and with that right hand which once bore the trophy, draw out the thread, and changing the tone of his voice utter his words in the sharper feminine treble? However, according to the anthropologist James Fraser, there was a darker side to the Saturnalia festival. In Durastorum on the Danube, modern Silistra, Roman soldiers would choose a man from among them to be the lord of misrule for thirty days. At the end of that thirty days, his throat was cut on the altar of Saturn. Similar origins of the British lord of misrule, as a sacrificial king, a temporary king, as Fraser puts it, who was later put to death for the benefit of all, have also been recorded. References to Fraser's view of this ancient sacrifice were made in the 1973 film The Wicker Man. While the later Roman custom of a lord of misrule is a master of revels, a figure of fun and no more than that, is most familiar, there does seem to be some indication of an earlier and more unpleasant aspect to this figure. Fraser recounts, We are justified in assuming that in an earlier and more barbarous age it was the universal practice in ancient Italy, wherever the worship of Saturn prevailed, to choose a man who played the part and enjoyed all the traditionary privileges of Saturn for a season, and then died, whether by his own or another's hand, whether by the knife or the fire or on the gallows tree, in the character of the good God who gave his life for the world. Tudor England in the Tudor period, John Stowe in his Survey of London, published in 1603, gives a description of the Lord of Misrule. I, and the Feast of Christmas, there was in the Kinge's house, where sour he was lodged, a Lord of Misrule, or Maester of Merry Disports, and the like had ye in the house of Uri Noble Man, of Honour, or Good Worship, were he spiritual or temporal. Amongst the which the mayor of London, and either of the sheriffs had their sewer all lords of misrule, euer contending without quarrel or offence, who should make the rarest pastimes to delight the beholders. These lords beginning their rule on Alhall and U, Halloween, continued the same till the morrow after the Feast of the Purification, commonly called Candlemas Day, in all which space there were fine and subtle disguisanges, masks and mummeries, with playing at cardes for counters, nails and points in Uri House, more for pastimes than for gain. The Lord of Misrule is also referred to by Philip Stubies in his Anatomy of Abuses, 1585, where he states that the wild heeds of the parish conventing together, choose them a grand capitaine of mischief, whom they ennoble with the title Lord of Misrule. He then gives a description of the way they dress colorfully, tie bells onto their legs, and go to the church, though the minister be at prayer or preaching, dancing and swinging their handkerchiefs. Decline of the custom in Britain With the rise of the Puritan party in the 17th century Church of England, the custom of the Lord of Misrule was outlawed as it was deemed disruptive. Even after the Restoration, the custom remained banned and soon became forgotten. In the early 19th century, the Oxford movement in the Anglican Church ushered in the development of richer and more symbolic forms of worship, the building of neo-Gothic churches, and the revival and increasing centrality of the keeping of Christmas itself as a Christian festival, as well as special charities for the poor, in addition to special services and musical events. Charles Dickens and other writers helped in this revival of the holiday by changing consciousness of Christmas and the way in which it was celebrated, as they emphasized family, religion, gift-giving, and social reconciliation as opposed to the historic revelry common in some places. See also Bracebridge Dinner Nine Lessons and Carols Notes 
References Asterius of Amasia, AD 400, Asterius of Amasi, Sermons, 1904 edition, pp. 111-129. Sermon 4, on the Festival of the Calends. From Latin. Oratio 4, Adversus Calendarum Festum. Transcribed by Roger Pierce, Ipswich, UK, 2003. External links On the Festival of the Calends. Asterius of Amasi, AD 400, transcribed by Roger Pierce, Ipswich, UK, 2003, webpage, ASTERIUS 4. James Fraser, The Golden Bough. The Roman Saturnalia, which deals with the Lord of Misrule.